Here we are in a small country lane outside the village of Ballykelly, which used to actually be a centre of population early in the 17th century. So we're going to take a look at the traces of the early 17th century fishmongers' buildings on this land. We're going to look at uh, Walworth Old Church. We're going to look at the bond or fortification that was central to the village that was once here. There used to be houses actually on either side of where I'm standing that are no longer here now because the village moved so by way of background, the fishmongers came to the north of Ireland as part of the Ulster Plantation. The Ulster Plantation was launched in 1609 under King James I, uh, and it was part of a long series of efforts that had been taking place for nearly a century by the English to exert control over Ireland. This began with efforts to impose the Protestant Reformation, continued with efforts to uh, colonize in the Midlands and parts of Munster in the 16th century, and ended up with outright warfare uh, by the end of the 16th century. 1601, we see Irish forces defeated at the Battle of Kinsale. 1603, Hugh O'Neill, the Irish leader, surrenders and submits uh, to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and following that, very, a very grand scheme for effectively colonizing the north of Ireland was pulled together, uh, particularly following the 1607 flight of the Earls, O'Neill and O'Donnell, to the continent. And this scheme was, on paper, very, very grand, and it involved carving up the lands, giving it to different individuals known as undertakers, those who undertook to plant the lands, to servitors, former military men, and then one large chunk um, of what became County Londonderry was granted to the London companies, the great medieval merchant guilds of the city of London. On their lands, they were supposed to build villages, they were supposed to remove all Irish tenants, uh, they were meant to uh, bring in the Protestant religion, bring in British settlers, English and Scots, and transform the countryside. Now, the London companies were not actually particularly interested in this venture. They were already investing in ventures uh, across the Atlantic, places like Jamestown, Virginia. But they were compelled by the king. They held the purse strings. They held the money for the kingdom. So they were, in effect, forced to invest in this venture. So the fishmongers received their lands, their allocation of lands, in 1613. And it was formally conveyed to them in 1618. They, like the other London companies, were expected to build a fortification, uh, a barn, a, a fortified enclosure for safety, a church, um, and again, bring in enough settlers to uh, transform and, and create a sort of new urban environment. When the fishmongers received their land, they decided to call their estate the Walworth Estate. And that was after a 14th century fishmonger uh, who was to some extent their, their, their patron, if you like. So that's where the name Walworth came from. So we are standing outside of uh, one of the remarkable survivals from that period, which is traces of their bawn or fortification. The word bawn, B-A-W-N, comes from the Irish bohon, uh, which was a cattle enclosure. So in times of uh, trouble, when defence was needed, you could retreat within the walls. Now, the bawn here at Walworth was 125 feet square. It was constructed before 1619, probably begun in the period 1611 to 1613. Um, and within it at the time, there was a 50-foot house. Uh, that house was subsequently replaced. But three of the four corner flankers still survive. They've been altered to some extent, so where gun loops used to be placed to provide defence, they've been replaced with windows in later centuries. But their footprint and, their, and the, the size of their build, they're quite uh, magnificent, still uh, remain to be seen. Now, in reality, uh, the barn also served as the manor house, so it is a key part of the settlement. Uh, it would have been important for socialising. Uh, so we see on the 1623 Crawden map a little pathway leading up to the door of the barn, and we have portions of the wall of the barn surviving as well as those flankers. 
Um, we see right outside of the barn actually houses were built, including small vernacular style Irish buildings, Irish cabins, uh, which would have been built by uh, local people, but probably occupied by incoming English or Scots settlers. Although we do know um, that throughout the 17th century, uh, that Irish outnumbered the English on the lands, both here in Ballykelly or Walworth, and certainly throughout the rest of the proportion. So we are very fortunate um, that we've got a series of maps from the early 17th century that give us a sense of what the fishmongers were doing on their lands. Uh, in 1622, Sir Thomas Phillips, who was a servitor or ex-military man, uh, was very critical of the London companies. And so he produced a report uh, basically trying to demonstrate the ways in which they had not fulfilled their sides of the bargain in terms of the amount of building, in terms of uh, the removal of Irish from the lands, and settling uh, more numbers of British settlers on the properties. So with working with Sir Thomas Phillips was the cartographer Thomas Raven. So the first map that we have to look at uh, shows us the lands that were granted to all of the London companies. So in effect, the county London dairy as was created at the time. And you can see where the fishmongers' lands are located, sort of in a bit of a strip, um, but I think not coincidentally with very good access to Loch Foil, because again, the fishmongers uh, are involved in that key economic activity of the fisheries. Uh, coming up to the village of Ballykelly, we have um, a very nice depiction from Thomas Raven in 1622, which shows us um, the bond uh, completed with its four flankers, uh, the two circular and the two uh, angled um, corner flankers. We can see the manor house on the inside of the bond itself, and then outside of it, a whole series of houses. Quite close to the bond, we can see three small low cabins, those are very much of an Irish vernacular style. And then we can see some of our more impressive, uh, in terms of size, um, English timber frame dwellings, some with the end chimneys, some with central chimneys, probably lobby entry. And of course, we can see the church. We have another map, a far more detailed map, which is in the Fishmongers' Archives in London. And it was produced in 1623 by a map maker named Thomas Crodden. And Thomas Crodden shows us a lot of the topography of the village. So we can see the course of the Ballykelly River as it was before it was canalized in the 19th century. We can see a common in the middle of our village. We've got an orchard. We can very clearly see the uh, extent of buildings at the barn. So we've got our four flankers again. But Crodden also shows us an attached walled garden, which still exists today. We see the church, which looks not dissimilar to how Thomas Raven depicted it with the uh, chancel built onto the end of the nave and the entryway through the long wall of the nave. And we see over 40 structures throughout the village. Most of these are houses of, of different sizes, again, a mixture of native Irish styles and English timber frame buildings. Uh, but we also have a mill and a mill race that's shown. And we get names now from Thomas Crodden. He tells us who owns these lots of land. That's how we know Pentecost the Smith uh, had a house in Ballykelly. We have Mark Green here. Uh, we have Loftus Jones. We have Arthur Breton. Uh, we have the Jackson family. We have Alexander Fuchs, who was a very important uh, uh, agent for the Fishmongers Company. So we're standing here in a really remarkable survival from the early 17th century. Uh, Walworth Old Church here is the parish church for the fishmongers. Um, and we've looked at the fishmongers already in terms of how they got here to Ulster. Uh, one of the precepts of plantation, of course, was to bring the Protestant religion uh, to the north of Ireland. So the fishmongers um, were fortunate uh, to have, um, we think, an existing structure and we're seeing part of that just behind me, that they could use as their main church. Uh, we know that by 1619, they had a church on this, um, on this site that was ready for use. And in fact, they already had a preacher, a Reverend Luke Astry, in place um, to minister to the congregation here. Now, there's been some mystery about this structure uh, for a long time in terms of whether the fishmongers built it anew uh, or whether it was, as I said, an existing structure. But digging into their archives, which are housed in London, in the Guildhall Library in London, 
it's clear there was an existing building, and that's what's right behind me. Um, what you can see, hopefully, is a really fantastic sandstone arch, a uh, really lovely, lovely construction. Uh, that may have been uh, one of the modifications that the fishmongers made to this building, or it may have been part of the original uh, Gaelic church um, chapel that was on this location. Um, behind it, off to um, my right-hand side, is the chancel. And by 1622, the fishmongers had constructed a chancel on the existing chapel. Uh, the one that we see here is a later rebuild from 1719. It's a bit larger uh, than what was constructed by the fishmongers between 1619 and 1622, but we know it was there in 1622, and that would have been the most holy part of the church. That would have been where the altar, or probably given the Puritan leanings of the Reverend Luke Astry, it probably would have been a communion table. So we're standing now inside um, the area of the chancel of St. Peter's Church, uh, and it was dedicated to St. Peter by the fishmongers because, of course, St. Peter is the patron saint of fishermen. Uh, so in this, uh, surrounding us here in the chancel, you, you can probably see a lot of different changes in the building. Uh, this structure was not, once it was rehabbed uh, by the fishmongers, it didn't go unchanged. And in fact, um, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that it was damaged, if not destroyed, in 1641, again in the 1690s. And then in 1719, um, the chancel that we see today was actually built. So the fishmonger's early 17th century chancel was actually a bit smaller. So on the wall behind me, uh, if you can, you can look and see above the, the lovely sandstone arch, there's just a trace, what we would call a ghost scar, of that older uh, roof line for the chancel, which was smaller. It wasn't as wide as the nave. Um, this 1719 rebuild, which was done by the Hamiltons, uh, made it the same width as the nave and the height. So we've also got some changes to the roof line and to the height above uh, the arch with the insertion of a doorway, which would have led to a floored surface over the nave. So when the chancel here was rebuilt in 1719, it was rebuilt uh, by Lieutenant General Frederick Hamilton. And his reasons for supporting the rebuild seems to have been actually so that the chancel, uh, the holiest part of the church, would house a memorial to his wife. And that memorial was beautiful, um, made, you know, Baroque style, made of marble, and it used to sit here. So you can see this recess was actually made to house that monument. Uh, all of our fixing holes here. Uh, you can go see that monument today in the current parish church at Tamlock Fin Logan. So we're standing inside the nave now, um, the nave of what was the original chapel on the site that the fishmongers uh, acquired and converted to Protestant worship. It's important to note that while the ideology of plantation uh, was the imposition of Protestantism, in practice that didn't. Um, uh, didn't happen in any kind of absolute fashion. And in fact, the fishmongers, while they acquired this church and used it for Protestant worship, uh, in fact supported the construction of a mass house elsewhere on their lands. And in 1632, it was reported by Sir Thomas Phillips that there were four priests officiating on the lands of the fishmongers because the majority of the population on the fishmongers' lands remained Irish and remained Catholic. Now, a few of the other things that we can see standing here in the nave is obviously um, it is now a graveyard. The church was, ceased to be used in 1795, and people began uh, burying throughout the, the building itself, as well as continuing to bury in the churchyard. Uh, it's difficult to miss the size of the Cather family mausoleum, uh, which is actually uh, breaking into part of the wall of the church itself. And it probably used stones from the building itself after it was deconsecrated uh, as, a, as an active church in 1795. Uh, so the original mausoleum was actually constructed somewhere around the turn of the 19th century. And what we see now as a neoclassical Egyptian style uh, mausoleum was uh, rebuilt in 1849. So standing here now, you can see the buildup of graves uh, in this graveyard, just from the height uh, and the hill going up to the church itself. It's also worth uh, noting from this location that where the Cather Mausoleum is, is actually where the church would have been entered in the 17th century. So um, in front of me is the Ballykelly River. 
and people would have come along the side of that, walked up this general direction and entered the church into the nave through a doorway about where the mausoleum was. And again, when the church went out of use, uh, the stones were, I suppose, to some extent fair game, and the Cathars, a very important mercantile family, placed their mausoleum in that location. So we can no longer see that doorway, but we can look back at our maps from the early 17th century, our 1622 Thomas Raven map, our 1623 Thomas Crodden map, and we can see where the door was located and also the windows on the nave that are no longer present. So standing in the graveyard now, uh, we, we see really a, an 18th and 19th century landscape to some extent. The surrounding walls, the enclosing walls of the graveyard are, are of 18th century date, and many of the stone markers out here are 18th and 19th century. A lot of them actually are not inscribed, uh, which is very interesting. They're very vernacular stones or plain uh, pieces of stone. I sometimes prefer those to the ones that are inscribed, um, not because I can, you know, I, I can't, learn necessarily who was buried there, but I'm reminded that people in the past would have known. Um, so that speaks of the community. You would have known who was buried in that location. Some of the other stones clearly are reusing materials from the church because in a few places we have stones that are former window moldings. So elaborately carved, lovingly carved stones that have found a different purpose uh, out here in the churchyard. So I hope you've enjoyed um, this brief consideration of, of St. Peter's Church, also known as the Garrison Church, and the history of 17th century Ballykelly.